Hey everyone, you're watching Kick Back and Chat with Amber Pickens. Leadership is something I've been thinking of a lot over this quarantine. And I'm so excited and so grateful that today I get to chat with the CEO and president of the National Urban League, the former and youngest mayor of New Orleans, and the author of the new and powerful book, The Gumbo Coalition. Please welcome Mr. Mark Moriel. Welcome to Kick Back and Chat. <laughs> I love the name. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited hey. that you're here today. Art, that's some beautiful Thank art. You, Memphis, my mom is so great at finding out good paintings and stuff. Boy, that is fantastic. Yeah, I can see that's Memphis. Yeah, whenever mm -hmm. my friends come to my place, they're like, this is like a, a black art museum. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm super excited to talk about your new book, The Gumbo Coalition. But before we get into that, how have you been doing during this quarantine? We, we're, we're safe, we're healthy, my family's safe and healthy. And uh, we've been working from home and all my teammates uh, who work at the National Urban League have been safe and healthy. We did have uh, one person lose a, 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 someone very close to them. So, you know, prayers for that. And of course, with 80,000 people nearly dead across the nation, and yeah, these are tough times. Yeah, for but, sure. And God, you know, we're safe and healthy and, and trying to sustain and continue our work. How has it been for you outside, outside of work, like at home activities? Do you have time for yourself at all? Because I know you're also the president of the. No, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no. <laughs> My wife is working downstairs. She's down in the den. I'm up here in my little office. I got my daughter's upstairs. She's working remotely. And my son's out because he's a graduate from high school and she's got one more test. So he's out, uh, got a little outside job cleaning up. Clean, he's cleaning a pool around the corner. Uh, so, you know, we're safe and we're healthy and we're hanging in there. But time for myself, the days just merge. Yeah. What's today? Mars <laughs> Friday? Yeah, I, I thought today was Friday this morning, but I was like, no, it's Thursday. And I do also do the devotionals with my pastor. He goes on live, oh, yeah. live every day on Facebook, and he thought it was Friday. And everybody was like, Pastor Carter, is actually Thursday. Mm -hmm. And he was like, the days just merged, y'all. I'm days sorry. I thought it was Friday. You don't know the difference. You don't know the difference between the weekend and the weekday. And all we can do is fight to survive. I mean, sure. we're fighting, fighting, fighting to thrive and, and, and do the best we can. Yeah. And I've been using this time since there is so much going on. And for me, I have more time to myself to reflect. So I've been doing the inward journey and I've been talking a lot about leadership skills, how I want to become a better leader. And for me, it's in entertainment because my background is dancing and acting. And wow. I'm really, yeah, I've been in New York City now since 2011, a graduate of the Juilliard School. And I really appreciate yeah. my career and all of it. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. The platinum <laughs> standard. Yes, ever since I saw um, Save the Last Dance, I was like, that is the school I'm going to. That is fantastic. Well, congratulations. Thank Best you. of luck on your journey uh, in the arts. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, like I was saying, leadership. That is what I've been spending this time really um, honing into. And last week, as soon as my mom heard about the Gumbo Coalition, she didn't waste any time. She said, you need to read this book. You need to interview um, President and Mayor Mark Moriel as soon as possible. And I am so happy I did <laughs> because I definitely will cherish this book for the rest of my life. Thank you so much. It's hard for me not to get emotional because we need this right now. I'm not going to like, Ugh. Let me yeah. find, uh, let me like, it was, uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun to share leadership lessons. It was, it was, it required me to really go inward and deep, 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 deep to remember and think about things again, experiences and, and, and really try to encapsulate uh, what I learned. And, you know, the lessons I've learned have been from the high and mighty and, and from people in the community. And I've got a story about uh, the building manager slash custodian, uh, Mr. Price. Uh, yes. He was business. And, you know, I love Mr. Price. And, and uh, I had to beg him for his secret formula for weeks. Uh, and finally gave it to me. And I started a business with a secret formula that mm -hmm. he used to shine for us. 
But, uh, you know, I think one thing about leadership, you have to want to lead. Yeah. Sometimes people, and if you're not predisposed to lead, that's okay. But I also have a chapter in the book which, which is knowing when to lead. And when to follow. Follow because depending on circumstances, places and stages, you may play a different role. Yeah. And you gotta be self-aware, understand uh, when, there's a, when you're playing a leadership role and then maybe you're playing more of a followership role. But that's an important thing that uh, people shouldn't think that the person who's a leader has always led in every circumstance and in every room all the time, every project that they're ever involved in. So amazing. Can you explain to us what does the Gumbo Coalition mean? Oh, so Gumbo Coalition was my, my descriptor of the political movement I led in New Orleans in the 90s. And it was, it was a movement, it was a generational movement, but it, meant, it was meant to reflect the fact that uh, we were capturing all of the ethnic groups of the city, African American, Asian American, uh, Latino, uh, all the religions of the city, Protestant uh, and Catholic, uh, Jewish and Muslim. Uh, we were capturing straight and gay. We were capturing all of the constituencies. And so it was meant to be a descriptor that said that you belong. Mm -hmm. There's a place in this political movement for everyone. Uh, and that was what I wanted to convey. And, 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 and it sort of was just a term that caught on because people in New Orleans know what gumbo is. And they know that gumbo is, uh, you can always keep adding and it gets better and better and better. Mm -hmm. That's the point with the gumbo coalition. You know, I was keep adding and it gets stronger and better than ever. And so what it reflects and what it means today, it means two things. One, gumbo leadership certainly to me stands for the fact that leadership is multidimensional. It requires vision, requires execution, requires communication, requires planning, uh, but also that leadership in the 21st century is about diverse, inclusive, uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-gender yes. uh, institutions and organizations and agencies and associations, uh, whether they be grassroots or corporate, whether they be trade associations or universities. Uh, and that's, that's what the people want, I think. That's what the people are demanding as this country moves into the 21st century. So that's what gumbo is. Mm -hmm. this, a little of that, put it all together, spice it up good, and we got gumbo. And I, I just love that so much. I love the Gumbo Coalition. I think that's such a beautiful, it's a simple, but yet so powerful philosophy just to hold on to for the rest of all of our, our lives. I think it's so incredible. And I know you said something um, about sometimes that's like this nation is we have all this here and sometimes in the midst of people trying to make everything one way we we um ignore the the power in our differences the power in all the authenticity that we all have and and america the united states of america uh has had a past that's both glorious and tragic uh, america that's embraced and uh, articulated great freedoms and has betrayed those freedoms for its own residents and its own people and its own citizens. And what we in the 21st century, uh, I think have to do is we're trying to build a better America. We're trying to build a nation which is truly a nation that's pluralistic that out of many can be one, and one does not mean to be monolithic, but it means to be diverse and inclusive. It is necessary. And, you know, in New Orleans, the Gumbo Coalition as a political movement was born of necessity. Because mm -hmm. New Orleans politics in the 70s, 80s, 90s 
if you couldn't put a coalition together, you couldn't win a citywide election. You had to build a coalition of neighborhoods and ethnic groups and factions. And even the African American community was in itself diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, so diversity is not just operates on multiple levels because in the 90s we had some of what you see in politics today you had a little bit of a generational divide you know you had a little bit of old guard and new blood and at the time i represented new blood you know i represented the upstarts i remember i represented the 30 somethings but but we couldn't ultimately win the election with just 30 somethings you know we had to build beyond we had to build confidence beyond so uh, gumbo you know as it was born uh, but today uh you know the national urban league and, and my work involves efforts to try to bring uh african americans and latinos and asian americans and uh, native americans and american indians and uh, like-minded white americans together to do good as a force for fairness and justice and equity. And that's, uh, you know, that's my life's work, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in politics or civil rights or the law, my life's work is about trying to commit. And the book, the book tells stories, you know, along that journey. I grew up in the early days of integration uh, in, 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 in a family that was deeply committed and active in the civil rights movement. And there was an incredible impact in learning uh, that 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 created. I had a chance to go to school in the Northeast, you know, the first sort of wave of African Americans, and went to you know Ivy League institutions as a as a young man, and, you know, a kid, a boy from the South, and 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 did that, and got a chance to go to a great law school at Georgetown, and then decided to go back home, and back home, got involved in politics because it was the front line of the work to improve the city that I love so much. Would you now, say, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go I was going to say, just thinking about your parents, because you shared so many personal stories that um, touched me so much throughout the book, but your parents, um, would you say that their experience, I mean, your father was the first mayor, first black mayor of New Orleans. Your mother um, wrote her book, um, Witnesses Change from Jim Crow to Political Empowerment. Would you say that their example and the foundation they laid has, has really been something that has fueled fueled you throughout your well, life? My, my my parents are my guiding light. Uh, you know my 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 mentors. Uh, my mother's you know in addition to me, my mother she's one of my very best friends. Uh, and I got a chance to see them work day and night uh, to raise a family and work day and night to improve the community. You know, they were activists. They were involved in so many things, it was hard to keep up. Mm -hmm. things it seems like it. I was like, they were involved in everything. They were involved, and, and I, you know, grew up thinking, you know, wow, it, that's what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. you know, is to be active and to be involved. And, uh, and they were, uh, you know, inspirational, and they pushed us. They were achievement oriented and they pushed us to walk through the doors that their generation opened. Mm -hmm. Very determined for us to do things that they couldn't do. And that's what really shaped the choices I made about schools I would attend. Mm -hmm. It was to go where no one from my community had really ever been, or very few from my community had ever been. And my parents inspired, you know, really inspired that. And uh, uh, it, 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 it was, uh, it was what I got from my parents was certain values, right? A passion for justice, a uh, unapologetic work ethic, a basic respect for people no matter what their station in life was. Mm -hmm. You know, a sense that you had to be about something. About something, yeah. Yes, you got to be about something. 
uh, and you can't just be uh, mesmerized by material uh, yeah. pursuit. And so it was a, you know, it was, I, I owe so much to them and I also owe a lot to uh, what they exposed me to as a young person, right? Civil rights meetings. And, I mean, I remember as a kid, I used to, I used to go to NAACP meetings. My father was a branch president when I was little. And man, I mean, I was a little boy. I'd be thinking, man, he'd be in there fired up talking. And that's sometimes, and I'd be thinking, what are they arguing? I didn't know, you know, what are they? These men, these people, mostly men, they're like fired up arguing, you know, and, and, and I'm like, this is, I didn't, I had no sense, right? And I'd go to the meet and I'd sit on the side. I was probably, you know, as young as four and five and six and seven, and eight years old when my father was president of the, of the New Orleans branch of the NAACP uh, and watched and watched a lot of that evolve and went to marches and rallies and all sorts of activities that took place. And it was interesting hanging out with my dad because when I hung out with my dad, I called it a low supervision environment. Mm. You literally go someplace with him and then he's off doing his thing. You like, you gotta be in the office, right? You, you little boy. You like, you know, I'm, I'm, go sit over there. But if you don't sit over there, if you move around, you just better be where you're supposed to be when it's ready to go. So, you know, it, it, create, it created a, you know, exploration, you know, and independence. Uh, as a, as a, and so those, those things, I think, but one of the lessons about about that is, you know, parents should expose their children. For sure, Grandparents, I completely agree. They should expose them to the life they're living. They should expose them to adult activities, positive adult activities, uh, I think is so important. But, you know, my, my stories, you know, are, uh, you know, important leadership stories about planning, about modifying a plan, about having compassion, you know, I talk about bringing the NBA to New Orleans. I talk about the fight. I love that story. Yeah. yeah I, mean, that was, I love that. I was like, that's dope. Cause it's like, um, cause you, you were talking about how your dad was, he wanted that and everything as well. Right. So I just yeah. thought it was cool. Cause it was like, you were just, it's, it's all, it shows going yeah, like, you're talking about the legacy. Yeah, and I mean, funny. The first time I walked into David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA's office, he looked at me, he said, you know, your dad sued us. Uh, <laughs> I said, yeah, he sued you to try to keep you from moving the team. I can't Just, believe his dad sued the NBA. I thought it was dope. I was like, wow. He said, your dad sued us, man. I said, that was my dad. I said, my dad was a fighter. My dad would file a lawsuit. My dad would, my dad, you know. It says, I, and, and, you know, I went there because I said, early on in my turn, I said, I want to bring the NBA to New Orleans. He looked at me and said, okay, you got to, you have an arena? No. You have an ownership group? No. So I'll tell you what, y'all just kind of, y'all, you sort of almost said, get out of here, right? <laughs> uh, I said, you know, Commissioner, we're building an arena and I'll be back. And I'm you follow it. through. And it was a long journey and it was an exciting journey. And now the New Orleans Pelicans have Zion Williamson and, and one of the you know, premier teams in the national. A basketball association and then I talk about the battle with the gun industry yeah uh, and a continuing fight against gun violence and how I became the first mayor in the first city to sue the gun industry you really challenged that and even reading about David. and they became velocity I mean you'd have thought that I uh kicked, uh, you know, a whole, whole community of Tyrannosaurus Rexes. I mean, they came back with ferocity and wasn't completely ready, but had to quickly respond. I mean, they clearly saw the lawsuit as a threat and they knew that I was opening the floodgates, opening the door for many other cities and communities to file suit and 35 of us did but we were putting a marker down against gun violence and about the proliferation of gun violence in our communities uh this lawsuit was just before columbine uh and uh 
but we know about the tragedy of that. So I tell stories, uh, I tell stories about corporate diversity and new approaches to that, and about networking. You know, yeah, the uh, importance of networking as well. Element uh, of, of every profession. So I encourage people to read it and learn from it and and enjoy it. You know, it's a it's a book of it's meant to be a book that people can learn. Mm -hmm. it's not a biography it's not a memoir but i tell stories from my life yeah and it was a joy to work on it uh after the anxiety and the i write a book oh you know what, this is going to be a big and it, it was a big task and it did take a long time and you do go through literally you know 20 30 40 50 drafts you, you lose you lose track of the number of drafts but had great help, great editorial team, uh, and, and a publisher that uh, uh, that uh, really supported me. But the, also with the Gumbo Coalition, it's such a good example of the power of vision. Um, you talk a lot about vision, just when you were even talking about your parents saying, really not getting caught up with the what's going on right now, like the the lights, camera, action. For me, it's lights, camera, action, and entertainment, but not getting caught up and really staying focused on your vision. I mean, you, you share about when you were a little boy, you were always interested in leaders and presidents and the importance of that and um, your little president's books that you had and you unfortunately yeah. lost in Hurricane Katrina. That, oh my gosh, I was just crying, crying through that. Cause I, re I remember Hurricane Katrina like it was yesterday, um, being in Dallas and everybody coming over. Yeah, but, right. What is the importance of no matter what, always being focused on your goal and, and your vision? You have to be because if you're not focused on your goal and your vision, you, you won't make it. You, you have a hard time succeeding. Now, you have setbacks. People have setbacks, bad days. Uh, tough things happen. Uh, challenges that seem insurmountable you got to keep a focus on your vision and people have to think you know and, and it's something i don't i don't use these terms in the book but people to some extent invent themselves they don't really invent themselves they become themselves and so you have to be determined about who you want to become now you got to be realistic about it you know uh if i don't have any musical talent uh I'm not going to be Duke Ellington, Biggie Smalls, or uh, Jay-Z, right, if I don't have any musical talent. Uh, if I don't have any uh, real talent around politics and public affairs, then uh, I'm not going to be a Cory Booker or Kamala Harris or Barack Obama or uh, Karen Bass, uh, you know, or Mark Morial. It's all about finding your niche. If you find your niche, You'll love your niche, your niche will love you, and you'll never believe you work the day in your life. Mm. When you do your avocation and passion, you don't watch the clock. When you do your avocation and passion, you never day and never have a day when you wake up and say, it's gonna be a horrible day. Mm. And I realize that a lot of people don't necessarily find their avocation and passion. But I want young people to, to pursue that. Pursue your avocation, pursue your passion. And sometimes to get there, you gotta take detours, you gotta do things on the side. You know, I had a job the entire time. I always had a job from the time I was 14 years old. Always had a job. Had a job every summer. When I was in college, I had a job. I worked in the mail room, I pumped gas, I was a construction laborer, you know, I worked in the African American Studies Department. Uh, I had I was a banquet waiter. I always had a job in high school, college, law school. And it's really about pocket money. It was about, but those jobs gave me some tremendous experiences. I mean, I remember, I don't talk about it in the book. I'm, when I had a job doing some of moving furniture. But what was interesting is I was on the back of a truck with two guys that had spent combined probably 20 to 25 years in jail. And they were men in their like early 30s. And they were incredibly smart, incredibly wise, and always funny. 
you know, but it was a learning experience to listen to them talk about their lives and their experiences and, and different situations. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you're going to learn from everybody you come into contact with. If you're a learner, if you're curious, if you're a listener, if you're a listener, and that's what I say, don't, don't be afraid to listen mm. and don't dismiss people because there's some way, you know, completely agree with or understand completely agree with or somebody why would i pay attention to that person that's not the kind of person i want you know it's just it's just an ability to learn and absorb to make you a better person so you know one of the inspirations from the gumbo coalition is learning from others and learning from men uh and listening i used to always say i used to be an eavesdropper my mother said you're an eavesdropper you're an eavesdropper you you be listening to phone conversations and you I think you're over there in the corner. You you like tuned into my phone conversations. You know, you're listening to me when you're a little boy. You know, you're you're always uh sure I said you're true, right? I was listening because I'm like I'm learning, right? And I'm yeah. picking up gossip and 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 so you know, curiosity, you know, curiosity is an important part of learning, it's an important part of leading. Uh so you know, I recommend and, and recommend the book and I wish you the very best in your career. Thank you. And I was connecting it to what's going on right now. And um, you talk a lot about leaders having compassion. Um, a, a quote I read in the news the other day is that coronavirus magnifies racial inequities with deadly consequences. Consequences, And I know so much has been happening in the Black community, and especially a lot of leaders are opening up shops and restaurants and nail salons, hair salons. Do you think that our leaders are really practicing compassion and understanding for what's going on? Yeah. Practicing compassion means that if you open up, you set conditions that ensure that people are protected. Whether they should wear masks, gloves, continue to physical distances, mm -hmm. distance. And the leaders have to use their bully pulpit to say to people, if we're gonna open up, these steps are steps you should observe. It, it's not about a set of rules and just you know, the police or somebody come and you know get you, you know warn you or ticket you. It's about saying to people, look, we've been through something difficult, tough, and challenging, and we know that there's no certainty. But as we open, I'm going to open cautiously, carefully, and prudently. Mm. So the last call I did just before this interview was with uh, my executive in charge of HR at the National Urban League, and we were talking about our return to work plan, how we do it gradually. But we haven't decided when that point is. Mm -hmm. Do we need to provide gloves? Do we need to provide testing? Do we need to do temperature checks? Do we need to require people to continue to distance themselves you know, in the office? Uh, what those steps do we, so those are steps we, we think we're gonna to have to take uh, to make people safe. Uh, do we say no outside visitors? I said, well, maybe what we've got to do is we've got to pay and provide everyone with lunch so that people don't bring lunch in, sandwiches in, food in. There's lots of people. Why don't we figure out how we provide a personalized meal for everyone? So we're evaluating that leaders, you cannot lead people if you don't care about people if you don't love people to love people to care who they are uh and, and it doesn't mean you're a soft person or, or a pushover it means you've got a balance inside of your heart your soul and your mind i agree guide you. Strength and love guiding in this instance leaders need to be guided by best interests in the health and safety of their employees, recognizing you can't be in work from protocol until there's zero coronavirus cases. Question is, can we flatten the curve and can we manage what might occur to ensure that people are safe and healthy and pray that those researchers, scientists in labs are close to finding a vaccine that works and that's safe. 
I know a lot has changed in these past um, few months, but what is something that you look forward to after this quarantine? I just want to see my family and friends in person. Yeah. I mean, my yeah. family, we're all, we're all tight, uh, you know, uh, but, but missing friends and family uh, in interaction. I mean, we've, technology has been great. I mean, uh, I see you, it's a, it's a wonderful picture. It's like you're sitting across the room from me. Yeah, that, it feels like that. <laughs> and I was like, thank God for technology. Yeah. Thank God for technology. We have technology, but you know, I miss my, I miss seeing my mama. <laughs> I miss seeing uh, friends and I miss seeing my teammates at work. And I miss, you know, kind of being in the mix, although, you know, I've been here at home and I've worked on a couple of projects here at home that have been delayed for three years. Because when you're at home, you kind of notice a lot of things. And uh, we, you know, you know, you sort of in a, a nesting routine. But I am, we are lucky we can work from home. There are many people going to work every day. Yeah, that's yeah. not to go and work and check in. And the healthcare workers, think about the healthcare workers versus doctors. They're doing the work to save people and save the nation. Yeah. But they're also in harm's way. If they're hospitals, nursing homes, healthcare clinics, correctional facilities, they're putting themselves, they're at risk, but they're essential and they're committed to mission. Sure. Every day they're putting themselves out there. At seven o'clock every day, we usually celebrate them by um, going to our windows and just um, giving them a round of applause here in New York City because um, they are definitely risking their lives every single day for all of us. That's great. That's great. And lastly, oh, oh, yeah. Lastly, I was going to ask you, who makes the best gumbo? <laughs> well, the only way you can answer that is your mother. <laughs> Or as we say in New Orleans, my mama. Yes. <laughs> so you got to, you know, the best gumbo is your mama's gumbo. And you better not answer the question any other way. Any other way, because she's going to come from you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mayor. I hope everybody gets to read the Gumbo Coalition. Um, this is so incredible. I love this book. I would, like I said earlier, I would cherish it for the rest of my life. And I think that we should all use this time wisely doing it. So thank you so much um, for your service and for chatting with yeah. me today. And good luck to you and I'll see you again. Thank, yes, you definitely will see me again. Yes, right. thank you so good much. Luck. Have a beautiful day. Be safe. Mm -hmm. Peace out. Yeah, thank you. Bye.